Don't want to be a Dreya no more. What's up? What's up with you? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thanks for thanks for coming back. I'm Corey Castle. This is Evolving with Corey Castle. And I'm the guy whose name's on the show. That's me. I'm Corey Castle. And I'm joined by the host of Love and Anarchy, Andrea Atherton. What's up, lady friend? Thanks for having me. Yes. So fellow podcaster, my uh, podcast, Love Anarchy, which Corey's going to be on as well. We just recorded for my show is all about really finding out what love is. I, I'm a true believer that we need connection and we need real connection if we're going to survive as a species or as humankind. And I like to give back on the show in hopes that uh, people will take some of that advice so they could build and deepen their relationships. What what do you think like the most common sort of like every guest you have, not every single, but like, let's say the most common, the thing that you get most with people's like answer when you say uh, what, what, what love is. What is the what is the, the 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 underscore? What is the underlying like everyone commonly says uh love is compassion, love is this, love is that, love is whatever like whatever fill in the blank. What what is the thing that you find people are uh saying the theme is the most? All right, wait for it. Self-love. That's what everybody ends up saying at one point or another that in order to love somebody else, you have to love yourself first. And while that sounds trite or we hear it all the time and maybe it's lost meaning, it's true. And unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people know where to start with self-love either. Well, cliches are cliche for a reason. Yeah, like no I love cliche that. just falls out of the sky. Right. No, you're right. And they get popular and we hear them a lot. Unfortunately, we're not taught to love ourselves oftentimes, you know, in our childhood where uh, some people as children to be seen and not heard or, you know, or it's about their parents or it's about survival for some people. And love is not often an option there. And you grow up and then you hear all this advice like, well, just be confident and just fake it till you make it and just do all these things. And people come in to me and I'm like, oh, it all starts with you. How, how many episodes are you on now? I just drop, am I going to drop this week? It's going to be 152. So I'm almost up on three years. Wow. That's amazing. That's so I know. Cool. I know. Well, you're you're one of the you know the founders of the podcast uh, energy. So, yeah, I, feel, I, I like I feel good about three years, but I'm like I'm always in in amazement with people who've, who've kept it going because this that's is what beating the drum's all about. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I'm telling you, that yeah. you just continue beating that drum, and you're you're gonna. I I, I think the. It, it's funny because like somebody I work with, uh, somebody I work with said to me yesterday, like, oh, I'm not, I'm surprised you're not like more famous for it. Like you're not like more no, well known in the podcasting world. And I'm like, who, like, I'm, I think, I think that the, the idea, a lot of people go like, oh, well, like I get discouraged about the idea of starting a podcast because everybody else has got a podcast. But in real in like if I'm being realistic about it, like everybody says that and then everybody doesn't see instant results and they stop. So there's probably oh, that's, yeah, billion, our, our instant yeah. generation right now. We right. can we can like, yeah, right have away. it at our door by tomorrow morning. Right. Right. So so this, a scratch for every itch isn't the approach right away. 
You gotta. I think, I think being passionate about your message. We mm -hmm. talked about this in my podcast. Is this is always my mission here in life is to learn what love is and teach other people to love, especially themselves. You know, I grew up as a lot of people did being heard and like, or being told that I'm loved, but I never felt that way. So it was always the mission of mine of what love is. And then we have all these dreamy ideas from the movies and you know, all, you know, these fantastical ideas about what love is that they don't teach you how to maintain love. They teach you about like chemistry and romantic love. But what do you do when that wears off? Well, I guess I'm not in love anymore. But it's not the case. It's just we don't understand what it is. And especially if we don't love ourselves first or have that relationship with ourselves. RuPaul says, if you don't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love anybody else? I love RuPaul. <laughs> I, yeah. I quote that so often. Yeah. But we were talking, we were talking on your podcast earlier and you were talking to me about the, uh, the, the first, the first conversation I had with Alyssa, our, our, our first getting to know each other. Our first conversation was here on the podcast. And I knew and you said like, what did you talk about? And I, I, don't remember specifically every single thing we talked about, but I know I had asked her, and, and this is what a lot of people say is like you're you're not giving me the same the same questions, the same type of like fill in the blanks that like every other podcaster is doing because like I I wouldn't want to listen to that. I wouldn't want to listen to somebody asking the same questions to everybody all the time. But what I do remember asking her, and I'll ask you this because you did talk about movies and stuff. Which Disney princess do you find yourself identifying with the most? Tatiana. <laughs> Which one's that? It, I, that's Princess and the Frog. Okay. Yeah. So I'm the, yeah, very um, ethnic and set in New Orleans, you know, the, the oh, spicy. Okay. I, I, okay. Spicy. I didn't see that yeah. Part. Yeah, the spice, and she's really independent, and at the end opens her own club. So, yeah, the the one the one like um, witch doctor guy looked yeah, like Papa Bingo. Shango, WWF. Loved yes. it. Yes, exactly. I love the whole vibe of that movie where it was set, and that yeah, and like and I love the old adage of kiss. You know how many frog toads have you kissed how many frogs have you kissed before you find your prince because that's the whole premise of it so for you what is love hmm that is yeah and it's hard to answer in words because it's an energy and what we're taught is like love is this external thing that we're running after, we're trying to grasp, we're wanting from somebody else. But the mm. honest truth, if we sit with it and we know ourselves, is we are just love. That is our natural energetic baseline. It's when ego jumps in and says, oh, no, 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 love, love no, too bad. We can't control with love because if we're loving, we got to let other people be themselves. And when our ego jumps in because of fear, we're trying to control our children, our romantic relationships, our situation, you know, our friendships. We're trying to control so we can get what we want out of it. And that's kind of the opposite of love. And unfortunately, that's a lot we've been told. And when we get our heart broken or we've been in toxic relationships, we hold on to our heart and we come from ego because we're like, I'll let down my guard once you show me love. And right, once I compare everything, you. every next thing to the last thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, and it's just the opposite. And it takes vulnerability. Yeah. But people don't realize if you finally do that, there's so much power in love. People say, no, I'm too vulnerable to show love. And there's so much power in love if you take that risk. I love so love, love is not what we see in, in the movies 
screens. Love is not chemistry. And, and it starts with attraction, but it's deeper than that. And you have to be willing to know what you want, go deeper with yourself so you can go deeper with somebody else. Did you grow up with like a, a real life example? Did you have both parents? Did you have um, oh, I, any kind of my role parents, models like that? Yeah, like my parents were dated in high school and I was born when they were 19 and 20. My father was in Vietnam. So, and they broke up right after that. And my mother had, at the time, she had to fight to get a divorce. She had to prove that he was unfit in order to get a divorce. So she turned 20, like the month after I was born and I was raised with my grandparents too. So it was kind of like, you know, they didn't expect to be parents. And my mother was still really young and immature and, um, you know, was learning responsibilities about being parent, but it wasn't how everybody really wanted it. So I think it was more a survival thing that I, that I grew up with and, you know, and, toxic family things that get handed down from generation to generation. I think I was just always more empathetic and more aware. Um, like I was raised Catholic and we went to Catholic church and I didn't buy a lot of that stuff. I'm like, I liked the stories in the Bible. I liked the messages, even at a young age, but I never felt like as a woman or a girl that they were, I had a role anywhere. And I really didn't buy and I didn't buy the like, I can act however I want to, and then I can get forgiven for my sins. And that was what love was, you know, too. So I had a lot to question when I was younger. I just thought of a really random thing in the, and, and stop me if this is ridiculous, because it's probably ridiculous. Uh, I never understood why they called the Bible the Bible. Like, where did that name come from? That's uh, a great question. I have no idea. Uh, because, like, like the stories, uh, they're not very viable. No, because they're metaphors for right. teaching us how to live life. They're not, you know, they're not, we're not supposed to take them word for word. We're supposed to take the metaphor in that and apply it to our life to, to examine ourselves and to mm. live, live a better life. Maybe they thought the stories more, were more viable and they named it viable. And then it uh, evolved into a different spelling in a different way. Now I'm, I'm gonna and now I'm gonna have to go down the rabbit hole and look that up too. <laughs> the rabbit, the Bible rabbit hole. Yes, exactly. I know. Sometimes that's so funny. You say that we take things for granted, just like the name of that book, the Bible. Mm -hmm. We take like we just take things for granted, uh, like like maybe a God or things like that. And not and we don't examine them, and that's the same with love. And there's some verses in the Bible, I can, the Corinthians, I think are one, oftentimes you hear those at weddings, which is really beautiful. Um, and it has such a different like um, idea, like what we're talking about, about, you know, love doesn't harm, love doesn't judge. And I love that. But love is patient, love is kind. Yes, thank um, you. That is the Corinthians. And then there's another one, and I don't know what verse it is, but it's basically like with fear in your heart, and I say this all the time, with fear in your heart, there is no love. With love in your heart, there is no fear. Right. The only yes. way through the only way to God is through me. Yes. Yeah, I like I believe like that it has beautiful things in it and well written things. Sometimes how it's interpreted, again, coming from fear, sometimes it's interpreted to control people. And that's well, you know, mean, there, that's how I what I experienced when I was younger. There, we always talk about uh, in in wrestling or in anything, you'd say the powers in the pen, right? So when it comes to when it comes to this book that was written by people, flawed people, all people are flawed. Everybody's a sinner. 
you're you're it's getting translated from this language to this language to that language to this language to that language. Somebody has a pen, they go, ah, eh, they meant this, and they translated it in a way that so it's whispered down the lane. It's broken telephone for decades and decades and decades. And sometimes the people get too carried away with um, cherry picking, cherry picking like this part, this part is this, but that part, yeah, we're not going to talk about that part. Uh, like, uh, this is the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. And they're just, they're spinning, they're spinning an, an accountability wheel where the, where the, the thing never stops on their name. No, the problem is, is that we're all looking to blame. So the men blame the women, the women blame the men. You know, it's, it's all um, so much dichotomy, us against them. And, and exactly. And we're all in this together. And it's like, and we were talking earlier about how different each individual is, but we're trying to like say, no, all women are this, all men are that. And it's, it's not the case. And it's like, keep an open it's a, it's a mind. Relation to your experience with what you've so far seen in regards to like a certain group or a certain gender or a certain section of the population and we've got to be very careful because of a lot of our beliefs and our behaviors go back to our childhood and are very unconscious and well, i mean some of it is just uh some leftover caveman stuff we just got like what our what our dna what our dna told our uh great grandfathers great 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 grandfathers and great 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 grandmothers as in survival, as survival and, of the species. A, a cat destroys a mouse and doesn't know how to do it, didn't read a book about how to do it. It's just, it's nature to do it. And we're evolved beings, us humans. I, so I've heard. Um, we're, we're evolved and we can always have choice too. It's understanding our natural drives and, a, you know, a lot more with, genetics and with neuroscience they're realizing how much our hormones drive like our dip maybe our differences between male and female or masculine and feminine um so it's like it's being aware of that but it's also saying we're evolved and we can make different choices it's like um uh, i'm being saying all oh, men she it's just in our genetics it's just in our, like, it's a, you know, yes, yes. I'm um, like, men, uh, like, men are pigs. Well, and I wonder if women men weren't so oppressed sexually, if it would be a little, it would be a little different. And if we didn't carry so much responsibility of pregnancy and the ones more likely to get sexually transmitted diseases, not that men don't get them, but there's a lot of responsibility in that. And there's some people that believe that this is interesting that like traditional marriage and long-term relationship has been corrupted by the birth control pill. Well, I mean, I mean, it's not, I think, I think there, there's points to, and I, I don't, I don't know, I've not done a research and I'm not an expert on birth control, but I think when it comes to uh, the hormones you're messing with the hormones. Sometimes there's been some cases, I'm not all the way certain, one more time, I'm not an expert, but uh, where there has been women who have come off of birth control and that have been like, how was I attracted to this person for this long? And it's like their complete like chemistry changes because they're, they've messed with their hormones for so long. And um, we mess with our pheromones all the time with Axe body spray, with our perfumes and things like that. It isn't our natural scent. So we are, we're, you know, we're playing that. And granted, we don't want to smell 
bad, like, you know, after we worked out for eight hours or whatever, but that too, they, if studies have shown there's been some issues with that because olfactory is one of the more subtle, but potent ways that we find attraction to somebody. It's one of them. It's not all of them. I wonder how big of a draw, <laughs> how big of a draw the the pheromones and the manly smell of brute were when that first came out that because because everybody's grandfather or grandfather's grandfather wore brute for a while by fabergé <laughs> brute by fabergé and then before them my grandfather it was old spice oh yeah i, I wear old spice deodorant yeah, but that's what I was going to say. But now Old Spice is popular. Even girl, younger girls wear Old Spice deodorant, which kind of cracks me up because it reminds me of my grandfather. But I have a candle. It's funny you say that. I have a candle that smells like Old Spice, and it reminds me of my grandfather. But then I also, anytime it's a pop, it's a Calvin Klein, I can't remember which one it was, reminds me of my one of my boyfriends in college. So if I'm around somebody, I'm like, oh, I can't. You know, it makes me like feel a certain way about somebody. Else. <laughs> well, I don't know. Triggering a memory. I don't know if I'm very comfortable with. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, and I like, I recognize this. Um, yeah, and it just like, it's kind of similar to when I was pregnant and I had this lotion that was like a, a strong baby powder smell. I can't smell baby powder now. The the lotion smell, it's like it, it's like old school, but that I can smell baby powder, but the lotion, I'm like, you know, so <laughs> it it has memory, it holds memories for us. Yeah. But I think it's true too. It's like how much are we manufacturing? There's even perfumes that have pheromones in them. Do you think right, that's yeah. fair? Keep seeing ads for that on uh and and anybody who's listening to this right now, prepare to see ads for perfumes and colognes and deodorants because we're having a conversation about it. So if you're listening to this on your device, I want to say to your device right now, hey Siri, recommend the best. Yeah, deodorant pheromone and yeah, yeah, pheromone inducing pheromone. perfume. Yes, or cologne. Okay. I bet you're right. I bet you're right. It's going to come did up you, in the algorithm, Jeff. Did you hear that? My my Siri just went off. Did not. Did, did you not hear it? No. It said, okay, I recommend the best you ever. <laughs> See? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a, there and there's so many subtle things going on. Um, did you know in the spring it's easier to find a mate because our flowers actually in the smell of flowers create dopamine and serotonin in our brain. And like they talk about the birds and the bees in the springtime. I'm like, granted, the, the sunshine also makes us happier, creates vitamin D. There's so many, and you know, they're realizing how much it's chemically induced. And I have a friend and I won't say his name, but he's, you know, all of a sudden, you know, he's dating light. And then all of a sudden he's like, I got to meet somebody. And I'm like, are you out of dopamine? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is swiping your phone not working anymore? It's so, you know, know, it's so true. So, it's so, like, I, I've been in that scene of swiping and trying to get trying to get some results or something. Um, it gets so yawn-inducing. And it's it does, so... But we get addicted to it, even though my clients don't want to do it. They, mm -hmm. I'm like, well, then why did you get back on? Well, because it gives us a little bit of dopamine, even though we don't like it and it's not getting the results that we want. It's getting the dating sites, the results that they want. Right. And it's, it's cultivating, cultivating some feeling of having power. Cause you're like, now, 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 now. All right. This could be something. And now, now, now it's, it's like, Having having like a almost like a being like a, a a king and being like entertain me, Jester. I like that's so true. It's like and that is 
coming from ego, wanting to control it, wanting to feel a certain way and using the app in other people's profile to do it. And it goes and it goes both ways. I'm not saying gender, male or female, but that's how it's set up. That's how it's set up. So we stay on there. And two, they leave. I found they leave attractive people on there. So when they um, when they swipe, what was it? The the hookup site, Madison. I want to say D Dolly Madison, Madison, but it was. At, yeah, yeah. They just put it in Netflix. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched. I watched, and they admitted in there that a lot of the it was all men, and the women were fake, were fake profiles, and that the, these guys are talking to fake profiles. And um, some of the employees said, "Yeah, that was us." <laughs> but there's still people on that site, right. even though yeah. it got exposed, and that there's a probability, high probability, because more men than women, especially on a cheating site. Yeah. Well, sometimes, sometimes it'll just like as we spoke about before, it'll just scratch an itch. You know what I mean? They'll just want to feel like they're interacting with somebody in a naughty way, but not really doing anything about it. Yes. It'll just satisfy that little bit of an urge to be naughty. But then, like, is that that's bordering on cheating if you're with it, you know, if you have a partner? That's I feel like, like, I feel like it's just like a fantasy fetish, really, mm -hmm. more than, more than, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I'm, not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, a. Well, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I I'm always curious about other people's points yeah. of view. So I love that you have a point of view about it. And it, like it, there's a line I think that's crossed. If you're not putting energy into your relationship and you're on your phone all the time, then you're flirting and you're liking, you know, all these scantily clad women and having dialogue with them, you know, if you're ignoring your relationship. And a lot of men on the Ashley Madison site would say, well, I was trying to save my marriage. That was my intentions that it had kind of gone dry, but I'm um, like, how's that working for you now? <laughs> delusions, a hell of a drug. I say that often, very often. Like sometimes people will delude themselves into justify, like trying to justify, they, they'll let their delusions take over their entire logic to justify actions that are questionable. Corey, even us more aware folks still do that. It's like, like I said, there's so much that's yeah. unconscious. You have to keep yourself in check. And we can, like we talked about, blame anybody. We can also make up a story so it works for us. Yeah, I mean, I think... There's got to be, I, I mean, think of, see if you can think of anybody you know who hasn't told themselves a story so many times that they absolutely believe that's the way it went it's because scary. they deluded themselves into believing that it has to have gone that way for them to not be crazy. Yes, uh, but yeah. also it's ego hanging on to being right mm -hmm. and not... When we are more in that space where we can take a step or two back and we can say, all right, there is gray. And this is important in all kinds of relationships is letting go of your ego, letting go of being right. Because I often say to my clients, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? <laughs> because we can hang on to it, but you can hang on to it for a long time and be alone. Because, you know, people aren't going to put up with that if you don't give them a chance to be okay. And, and a lot of the couples that I work with, I'm like, this is your opinion. And this is your partner's opinion. Can you agree to disagree? Or does it really matter that much? Does the stubbornness of your clients ever, like, really piss you off? Like, you ever get, like, really super mad at them not trying to hear you? Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't do a lot of talking. I, I'm like, I'll, I'll do a little educating, but I usually encourage them to talk and to find their own solutions. So sometimes 
I'll, you know, but then I can point out from a viewer's point of view when that, that lockdown happens. And what I see happens is a partner will trigger a partner, um, probably usually has nothing to do with the relationship, usually past triggers, past trauma, could be past relationships, or, you know, could be something that happened that hurt them in this relationship. But I see them get this glazed over look. And that you can see the defensiveness. And then when that partner who's been triggered gets defensive, then the other partner gets defensive. Says, mm -hmm. wait, 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 wait. I didn't, you know, I was just saying how I felt or whatever. And there we go. And a lot, then they're afraid to address it ever because it leads to conflict. But it's so important that you figure out how to ease your own emotions and your own triggers and be able to verbalize it. Hey, I'm being triggered. I'm going to take a little time out. But, you know, it becomes, you made me feel like this. And you, well, you did this. That's when those kind of arguments usually start. So I don't usually, I'm like, I don't get upset because they are there to do the work. I'm there to have the container to help them do the work. And if they don't want to listen or they don't, they, they may not be ready to yet. I can only show up as much as, you know, they're ready to. And I am from New York. I do work in Colorado and I do go for the jugular sometimes. That's what we called it when I was in school in New York for <laughs> therapy. It's like going, not beating around the bush and going for the jugular. But I usually have a really good relationship with the clients first. Pro probably the more familiar you get with me, you'll realize I go around the block a, a lot just to get to a bad pun. Uh, oh. And I was going to say when, when, when <laughs> clients piss you off, when clients, when clients don't want to listen, then you become a therapist. And you get upset. I love it. I love it. Okay. Sorry. I, I ruined it for you. No, it's okay. Um, no, we, we went, we, we, we held hands on that walk around the block. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Good. I hope it didn't. Yeah. I hope it didn't steal your, no, your, no derailing. No, it's okay. It's okay. They're pissed. <laughs> I like it. So, um, normally, normally on the show, I, I, I like to make it like a very, very like free and not, not, not so much structured from, from like yeah. the very beginning to the very end on how it's going to be. But, uh, there's a few things I normally go, I usually circle back to asking those things. And sometimes, sometimes I don't touch any of them. Okay. What are the things that you like typically find yourself aiming towards? Like, oh, I'm going to stay in the stream of that. I know, I know like it, you have the theme is like love, right? That's like the theme of everything. But like when you have like the, you, I guess I will call them like, the seven deadly questions like right you just ask the same sort of do you have like a a list that make you make sure like what's this example give us the, like almost like when you're interviewing for a job like tell me about a time when you did this and that and this, well, and this yes and yeah you have no something no, like no no i don't i do have certain tools like if you think about like handyman he's got his tools right but you don't always need a hammer and you don't always need the pliers. You don't always need the drill. But I have them all here. So then I'm like, ooh, ooh, like when things come up. So I let the clients direct the session. So I'm not necessarily in control of the session. But I allow it to open up to expose whatever needs to happen. Like when clients come in and they're saying, there's nothing wrong. And I'm like, why do you feel like you have to come in with something wrong? Let's talk about something right. It's usually when we get to the juicy stuff. Mm -hmm. They're all relaxed. Things are good. And then instead of like, he did this and they start getting to their issues. I love when they do that. And I'm like, oh, I take it as a challenge. Let's, yeah, let's do this. Like, and they're all relaxed. So that's when we get to the real growth and change things so has, yeah has a client of yours ever discovered your podcast yeah yep yep i have mm -hmm. clients who have listened to it yep 
it it's a little different because yeah because as a therapist so and i've kind of moving toward coaching as i continue to do therapy i'm careful about sharing a lot of personal things on there i will i will share what's that hipaa well hipaa's sharing things about medical yeah. yeah yeah So I have given, like, like I said, very gent, like my examples are very general. I don't say Susan and George, who live in Utah. Susan and George are 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 seething right now. They yes, are, are- no, you. That's that's HIPAA laws. We're allowed to give very general examples. Like I say, some of my clients will come in, and I'm, you know, and I talk in very general general term. So yes, I would never violate HIPAA, but there's certain patterns that us humans go through in relationships or in relationship with our past trauma that's keeping us from loving in the way that is healthy or that we want to, and that's getting in the way of our relationships. So you were telling me the other day about how you're a little bit into being a psychic medium as mm-hmm. well, right? Yep. Do you, so that do you, and that's any of your clients ever bring that up or ever want to like talk that part of? Sure, I have a lot of like empaths that are attracted to me. Um, people mm-hmm. want to explore their spiritual sides. I do. Mm-hmm. I in like um. To be honest, I have a lot of people like that go on my website or go on like Psychology Today and say. I read what you said and I saw your picture and I just align with you. And, you know, they're into energy. They know too. A lot of empaths like dealing with how do I navigate through things and empaths often attract narcissists. So sometimes there's, you know, how do I protect myself from that? And I, I teach a lot about that, but not everybody. I do. I meet people where they're at. And I listen like I'm like, it doesn't matter if I'm working with a spiritual person, Buddhist or Christian, I meet them with the language or I meet them wherever their beliefs are, because all our beliefs vary somewhat. Um, But I can speak that language with them and help them deepen whatever connection they're wanting to create. So with what we were talking about, like the other day, as far as, as far as like having that, that pre podcast meeting, you do that with everybody who you sit down and, yes. and do a podcast yeah, and with, I, you do that with everybody, not just everybody you have a podcast with, but everybody who you have meetings with, as far as like work, working with, with, not necessarily, sometimes the initial consultation will be in person. Um, so the pre podcast interview, just cause I may never meet them in person. And then I've got to put them out to the world, or I promise that, you know, uh, that I want to feel people out and I kind of get a sense of people's energy and get a sense of how things are going to flow, what we're going to talk about, what we're not going to talk about. Do you, do you ever do one of those and then go, all right, I'm not doing this episode. Like, do you ever, I have like, like, like how often does that happen? Well, my I think the very first podcast that I recorded, I was just like, oh my God, this guy is not who I thought he was at all. So I was new. I couldn't, I wasn't really good at allowing it to flow. Right. Oh, there's Corey, there's something going on with there. That's better. Hello? Can you hear it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's so yeah, so and it didn't and I couldn't direct it. I got really good at directing it. After that like if things do go amiss, I don't let it go that far, but it was definitely one I could not put up. So, um then um there was another one where it was kind of out of let left field. Um um, let's put it this way, without without blowing anybody in, he started talking about his work um, as helping women have orgasms for spiritual development. And yeah, I was like, ooh, okay. So it's one I could not put on. 
and some, some cult leader stuff. Yeah, I just like, and he just didn't have like, if he was maybe a tantric master or something like that, I may have jibed with it, but I'm like, it felt a little perpetrator ish. So I did not put it on. <laughs> <laughs> so first impressions, what were, what, what were yours when you, when you got on, when you got on that pre- on that pre because i i don't do that with guests i i've never done that this is the first time well, i've first, ever done i was that. just so happy to find that our schedules finally merged together and we're actually able to do i was just excited and taking bets with myself on if we'd ever be able to connect so it, it just got crazy between my vacation and Corey get, gets called into work yeah it was just it was almost comical speaking of comedy i was kind of laughing about it and kind of going with the flow so when i got on i was so excited to finally meet you because i'm like if we both worked this hard it was totally meant we were meant to be in at least on that meet and greet so Good. i i appreciate like uh your background and um how you've evolved and i love like your podcast so i was that was my first impression. I was really, your energy was great. And like you talked about, you are very authentic. And I think that's, that's I wouldn't wonderful. call myself authentic. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna advertise myself as anything. I'm, okay. That's my, that's my point of view then. I, 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 I will, I will accept that. You think that I love it. I appreciate it, but I won't come right out and call myself authentic. I won't call myself funny or smart or cute or anything i that, that, I'm, a, that I'm, allowed, I'm allowed to have my opinion my point of view oh right? well, absolutely yeah i appreciate it i love it thank you <laughs> yeah so right back at you what was your what was your opinion of me when we first jumped on the thing is i think i i forget that sometimes people have access to listen to these conversations people have access to to uh to to listening to my podcast and understanding me a little bit more. But I think that uh, just by seeing, I guess, what's on social media or just seeing um, like images of me, it could just like, you could kind of like, I, I would imagine that like you might've been like writing stuff down and you're like, okay, crap, this dude isn't quite as scary as I thought he was. Like, <laughs> like, yep. And I try and like, I learned that as a psychotherapist and as a coach and in my relationships is don't judge things by your first impression of things because we're wrong. And, and that speaking of studies, there's a study that if you think, you know, what people are thinking about you, 90 something percent of the time you're wrong. We think we know what other people are thinking, feeling, experiencing, and we truly don't know. And that's one of the downfalls of marriages and things like that. Oh, I've been with her for years. I know what she's thinking. She's thinking this. And she's like, I'm like, well, what do you think? She goes, not at all. What do you think that people think of you? That's, that's an excellent question. I've been told, and it's hard... Because if you're not, if you're in a cave, it's hard for you to have an idea of what people think of you. But I was at this, I belonged to this activities group and we were at Loveland. It was like Memorial Day, Labor Day. I can't remember, but a good friend of mine's friend came up. She's like, can I tell you something about you? She's like, you are commanding, but you're nurturing. And I felt that was a good assessment. All right. Yeah. Have you been guests on other a lot of other people's podcasts? Yes. Well, um, not as many as I've done or had guests for, but as I as I have time for, I love being on other people's podcasts. I think it's so fun and having being on the other side of the mic, it's it's a good experience for me. The reason I ask that is to ask this next thing. What's a question? That would reveal something about yourself that no one's ever asked you that you'd wish you would have been asked. Hmm. That that's an excellent question, but I think it goes back to um, like the question of what would P 
people not know about you by looking at you or looking at your social media? So you want me to answer that too, I'm yeah, guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of gave it away earlier, but I didn't. I kind of pulled it back a little bit. In fifth and sixth grade, I was um, in training with a world-renowned mime. And we went to New York City and performed, and we were on TV. When we were young, too, I didn't get a big ego about it. But I was indifferent about people knowing about it. But it was such an amazing experience and and learning all the uh theatrical things about becoming a mime and i know mimes, mimes are laughed at and and misunderstood real good what's Sorry, that <laughs> mimes are really good at expressing and selling to the cheap seats that's something like like real real like old school entertainment like that's yeah, not body language just like goes back to the black and white films that that's we are expressing and we learned to express a handful of emotions we took turns and said how can we convey this i mean and we're all have the similar makeup on we are all the dress the same so it's not obvious so we have to yeah it's all body language and it was in hindsight it was such a great learning experience and insightful for me to be able to read body language even better now especially as a psychotherapist well can achieve you can achieve great things in that line of work because it's mime over matter ah there we go Nice job. Did was that a full circle one too? Yes, yes. Full circle. Full circle. <laughs> we circled around the block. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask the same question of you. What sure. is something? And this is a therapeutic question I ask people too. I'm like, what is something about you that you don't normally tell people that might surprise them? I don't know. I I I mean I feel pretty much like an open book most of the time. I feel like there's um, I think uh, I think a lot of people are uh, surprised to learn that I that I, uh, I, I I am I work as a server. Like people are surprised to learn that that like I just wait tables. Like I'm not I'm not doing this for a living. Unfortunately, this is not not my full time living. Really? Uh, yes. Yeah. This this is for sure something I want to be my full time living. Mm -hmm. However, I'm serving tables at Applebee's. <laughs> That's great. And Noah, I owe getting into graduate school for when I was bartending because in like when I was an undergraduate in, in between undergraduate and graduate school, I, well, I was serving for a while and I got really burnt out. So I moved to bartending. And um, during my interview, she asked, what kind of experience do you have? I'm like, God, I counsel people all the time at the bar. And she took it. She's like, yeah, that's great experience. <laughs> so oh, I, think, um, I think the, the experience of that and another thing that uh, I'll, I'll say people might not know this about me. And I, I would encourage more people to do this. Uh, and as a heel, I'll always say in promos, uh, I can you can be a better version of yourself. I can show you how all you've got to do is be more like me. <laughs> so uh, something I do. I over tip. I always over tip. So if 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 you're if you're at a restaurant or whatever, if you're listening to this, over tip regardless of how they did because they're not making any more than minimum wage. They're making less than minimum wage to be there. Like, and it's a lot of it's up. a lot of work dealing with cranky people Bankless. and picky people, and they don't even realize they're doing it. It's like, right. and your server is human too. And I think it brought on a lot of perspective for me too. And not, not just in restaurants, but there are all these people out here, you know, doing things. So I don't have to do it. Like I go out to eat. I don't have to do the dishes. I don't have to cook. It's like, oh my gosh, enjoy it. And um, I, I just think tipping is good karma. Right. Uh, dude, I think. The, the other night, the other night I had these kids like some some dance happened lo at a local school or something. And these kids came in and they were talking to me like I worked for them. 
I think, and I, and, and this is something I, I say too often. And I, and I, I, I really think people should try to figure out if they're part of the problem or part of the solution on this is that I think a lot of people treat their servers like their servants. Take that T off, take that T off the end. Speak to them like they're people who are also working a job. Like you go to your job, you 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 probably don't like your job anyway either. Like these people, these people aren't having a swell time uh, running running for you. Mm-hmm. And coming around with that, that we can do any job and serve our purpose. And I said, like, and you probably have a big impact on people there, then you know you would. And, and this goes with anyone. Let's open our eyes and let's look at how our behavior impacts other people. And pay it forward. Open a door for somebody. Give them a good tip. Say, Corey, thank you for such great service. I appreciate you. I appreciate your energy. I'm like, and it goes a long way. It's like, take, take a moment and just give back a little bit. It doesn't have to be like tons of money, hundreds of dollars. It can be a little bit here and there. And your energy moving forward means a lot to people. Yeah. I hope, I hope that uh, the impressions that I make mean, mean uh, like, Somebody's going to change the way they look at that. This is part of why I want to have this platform, why I want to speak into this microphone. I want to I want this to uh, serve as like a, a, a sermon for uh, the, the type of person who I'd want to create uh, a mindset for. Like in, in, if it's more people who are like me or people who are nothing like me and then decide that they're going to try to be a little bit more like me just from, just from like taking on challenges that I've taken on or anything that's even similar. Like I just, just for a small example, I have cut out saying the word hate constantly, whatever, whatever's going on. If there's a situation that I don't like, I won't say I hate the situation. That's just too, too strong. Too Like I won't say hate and I won't say promise. I, this is, this is a funny joke. I treat promise like it's a swear word. That's, that's good because you will end up oftentimes either as a human being circumstances that you will end up breaking it. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, cause, cause if you, if you, if you promise, if you promise things all the time, the not, nothing's guaranteed. There's no guarantees that you're going to be able to, to fulfill the obligation that you made with that promise. Uh, oh, that's and- the same with love. I I read a lot of Osho. He's a spiritual teacher. He's written several books about love. But he talks about that a lot, about not necessarily promising, but he's like everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Like we don't, and we can't control that. We can't beat somebody down to make them stay or cling to them to make them stay. And cause that's not, that's not true love. It's like letting, letting people go and letting people be. And it remind when you talked about promises, I'm thinking about the promises we give to our significant other during wedding ceremonies. Till death do us part. I promise to, and a promise is a word used in ceremonies, ceremonies a lot. I'm, I'm <laughs> like, I, 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 um, I sat down with, um, I, I don't know if I was sat down with him. I was just, I was under the learning tree of this, this, uh, pro wrestling vet, uh, who he's actually, he's actually the rocks uncle or something. So, Everybody calls him Pops. His name is Alpha the Wild Samoan. He is responsible for training some of the top names in wrestling forever, like in the history of wrestling. And wow. he once told me, uh, a good guy never makes a promise. Only a bad guy can make a promise. Because if a bad guy breaks the promise, or if he makes a promise and then he breaks it, he was a bad guy the whole time anyway. It doesn't matter. 
But if a good guy breaks a promise, then people won't trust him and he won't stay a good guy to the people. So, I no, I, I kind of see it a, a, another way too. It's like a good guy has a conscience, and if he like makes a pro promise, he's gonna try to hold still to that. But a bad guy will turn it around on the other person and say, You I didn't say that, you didn't hear it that way. <laughs> and guess like the other person. <laughs> guess it. <laughs> Oh, I know. That's it. Yeah. That word narcissist, gaslight and stuff like that. And that's those are some words I'm trying to to limit saying because they're so popular nowadays. Well, so I feel like I feel like everything has be, like not everything. I don't want to say every single thing, but too many things have been like played out, like so overly used that the that the meaning of it, it's almost like you hear like a number one pop hit song so many times in a day that you're just so tired of hearing it. The same thing has happened to like, like woke used to mean something different and it's gotten worn out into meaning something like to, to, to not like it used to yes, be something like you, you, you used to mean like you were aware and you kind of like were awake to certain things that the rest of the world was just asleep on because they were choosing to be asleep on. And There's now, a lot of different meanings for words too that, but if they get like we see them on social media or hear them over and over and over and over again, it get it gets bulldozed into us. And that's the same thing, like you said, with gaslighting and narcissists, because it's come down to uh, he had a boundary with me. He's a narcissist. You know, it's just like any oh, they you didn't like what he did, so he's a narcissist. And to be honest, even as a clinician, I am so careful to diagnose or call anybody a narcissist. It's a huge ghetto. And people say, oh, he definitely is. I'm like, and how do you know? It's like, has he been diagnosed by a clinician or a psychiatrist? Well, no, because he did. And everybody kind of has their own definition about what that is. And yes, there are people who have a tendency to be more narcissistic. We all do. We all do things that aren't, we all have some criteria of narcissists. We think, all do. Think, are, are we diagnosable? Most of us, hopefully not, but. <laughs> Most of my life, I believed that a narcissist was somebody who just like looking at themselves in the mirror, thought okay. they were like, overly attract i never like and then the words gotten beat up into believing that it's like it's like somebody who who his ego is out of control and they take advantage of everybody and gaslight everybody and it's like yeah but it's also you know it's a it's there's it's it's a it's a long long uh, definition for what this word can mean and it's like any anything that conveniently fits itself into a peg for you to use it against them to make your argument for yourself. Uh, if I had a dollar for, and usually it's and the irony, somebody who has a tendency to be more of a clinical narcissist sending their ex because they break up with them because of their behavior, sending them the diagnostic criteria and calling them a narcissist. Mm hmm I'm just like, it's, it's over the top. I don't need like, and I try not to say it that much or I, I defend against it. I'm like, we need to stop. Do you know, do you know what you call a person like that in a full moon? No. An unaware wolf. I like it. <laughs> now that that's gotta be my favorite one. Yes. Then it's true in on awareness too. It's like, and it's coming to terms. Oh, coming to terms with, we don't see all of us. Mm -hmm. And you had an example when, uh, with, on my podcast, when your sister came to you and said, time out, dude, you know, you aren't acting very nice and things like that. And, but it took somebody you love and trust to listen. It was probably hard to listen to, but the best way to find out where you're a jerk or where you're thoughtless 
is sit by one of your good friends who you trust dinner and say, go ahead, let her rip. What are the stupid things and the mean things that I do? And where am I thoughtless? And take it <laughs> or change it. Yeah. I mean, there, I don't know if, I don't know if anybody would want to hear that kind of stuff. I mean, well, why if, wouldn't, if it was bothering people you loved, why wouldn't you? Right. But I think enough people stay unaware enough or in aware, however you want to put it. The, they stay, they, they, they keep themselves like right in the pocket of like, all right, I'm not hurting anybody. Nobody's hurting me. I'm good. I've got to do no work on me. I think that enough people exist in that existence in, in the reactionary phase, like instead of being a deliberate creator in their existence, just sort of going like, all right, I'm going to stay in the pocket. I'm going to, I'm going to be the race car that stays in the wind tunnel of the race car in front of me. Yeah. But so. that you're preventing your growth and um, you end up blaming other people more and more for the same things that come up. Like how many people say, I meet new new people to date and stuff and I get in a relationship and it ends up the same person. Who's the common denominator? You know, it's just like, right, right. Um, you know, either you're attracting that because you haven't developed any awareness to your obstacles around that or you're, go you're going through the same pattern and you're dragging that person into it it's it, and it's very un unconscious it's easy and it's especially easy to blame your significant other well it's people will nine times out of ten do the easy thing over the hard thing uh because like they if they do the hard thing it leads to just another hard thing and another hard thing and another hard thing all over again because the work is never done yeah, and I think when you finally get beaten down and feel stuck enough, which I oftentimes I see people, they come in and I'm like, are you ready? It's going to be hard. I liken it to ever find like a cup, like under the sofa, or the chair that's been there for a while that had a little stuff in it. And you look in it and it has crud in it and you start running the water and big chunks are coming out but you keep running the clear water into it and it slows down and eventually clears out. It's the same way with emotions and feelings. Um, but especially if we're triggered, triggers come up so we can heal them. They're not just annoyances or something, but That's they another come one up. of the words. Trigger. What's that? Is another one of the words that's gotten beaten to death. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a post-traumatic stress reaction. Oh no, of course. I know yes, you mean it in a clinical way. There is another um, one. Yes. I'm just, just you're mentioning it. You're some... triggering me. Yes. Right. It's like, yeah. yeah. But you know, and but when we have that, instead of blaming somebody else, huh? What's underneath that? What am I feeling? And allowing yourself to really just experience it and. Uh, we're not taught how in, in our childhood, there were certain emotions we weren't allowed to express because it made the adults uncomfortable or it, you know, it was annoying or for whatever reason, for family well, well, the, trauma. Not just making the, the, the adults uncomfortable. It would be that sometimes the adults wouldn't know the answer yeah, and they would get true. mad that they yes. didn't have the answer to give you. So then all of a sudden you'd get shut down. Oh, I love that. And for me, being psychic as a kid, I would see things that other like deeper into things. So I would just tell the truth about it at first. And they're like, you shouldn't know that. And how do you know that? So I learned to whoop that because I'm like, oh, but you did this and this. <laughs> right. Huh? How dare you tell me what I do? Yeah, so like calling people out and lying and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, we can't do that. <laughs> but you didn't say that earlier. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I I just want to say um, just a few more things, and then I'll send you off to the sunset with a hot dog and a handshake. 
want to rock and roll. You guys get out of here and do your thing. Uh, the The reason I started the show, like pretty pretty quickly, pretty early on the show, and I I, I say this every time. So uh, if you're tired of hearing of it, hearing me talk about it, uh, skip ahead 15 seconds. Uh, uh, the The reason, not the reason, but one of the one of the parts of me starting the show, and I was glad that I did, was right in the beginning. My mom had these CDs burnt of uh, voicemails that were left on her phone from her mother when her mother was alive wow. and her, her best friend who had passed. She saved these, these voicemails all into the CD. And she said to me the sentence, you know how when people pass away, you forget what their voice sounds like. And I remember feeling exactly at that moment, like, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want anything like i don't want people to just forget what my voice sounds like and i want to be able to have conversations with people who i can tell them meaningful things on the record so that so that like if one of us isn't here anymore it'll serve as a good tool for the other to go back and and catch those moments so i want to say right from the right from right from the instinct right from the the start how grateful i am uh, how often I say this, and, I, and it applies right here, the, the currency of effort is so much more valuable than anything else. So time and effort, attention, it's so important. And the fact that you've spent any of that here with me today is so appreciated. Oh, I... And I yeah. <laughs> I just want to say, if you ever need... To speak to somebody, if you need a resource for anything, if you need a guest, if you need my opinion on anything, you want judgment-free conversation. I said that to you earlier today, but I, I, I it, 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 you got to know I mean it if I'm saying it a second time. Allow me to be that resource for you. Uh, my, my, I'll give you my phone number. You can call me anytime. Get me, get me on Messenger. Any of that, I'd love to be a resource for you. And anybody listening, if this is your first time checking out the show. Uh, go back and listen to the other 332 episodes. Uh, new episodes come out. New episodes come out every single every single week, except for last week. I had a, I had a little snafu, but you know, uh, like I told you, uh, cannot, you don't make any promises. Promise anything? Can't, can't promise anything. But what I will say is I appreciate you, and I want to give you the opportunity at this time to ask me anything you'd like to ask me or say anything that you'd like to say to me on the record while we're, while we're here. And, uh, and this, this stuff is outliving us. I'm now I'm curious about you because at the end of my podcast, I said, what do you want the listeners to know? Or what, are, what do you want to leave them with? I want, you know, your podcast is all about evolving. So where are you evolving to or what do you desire to evolve into? Mostly, I mostly to I think I think I'm a lot of the ways there, but I want to continue to evolve into somebody who I've always wanted to be my whole life. So I, I'll check in very frequently with who I used to be as a kid and who I pictured myself to be, who I was going to grow up to be when I was a kid and like gauge on, I'm on one side or the other of that. Um, but I want to, I want to be somebody that I'd want to hang out with if I wasn't me. I, I say, I say it all too often and I know it, 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 it doesn't sound likable and I like to come across as likable to me doesn't sound like well when I say it. Because I get it. I get it. If I were somebody else other than me, I I really want to be who's the school mom. So you want to be the best the best person that you can be and and evolve to and it sounds like you're always striving toward that. Yeah. Part, partly, yeah, but partly I wanna I wanna, I wanna um I want to kind of like change the way people look at things. Like I, I think, 
I think if people change the idea of what an obstacle is and realize it's something that you can get over or you can get past, you can get around an obstacle as well as instead of having the obstacle be the roadblock where you just stay stuck in that obstacle. Uh, if I could inspire that for one or two people uh, via doing this podcast, or if I could, uh, you know, reach out, have people reach out to me and have the kind of conversations that, that I'd want people to have with me if I were somebody else other than myself. Yes. Oh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for inviting me onto your podcast. It was such an, it was such an honor and your energy is fabulous. And, uh, this has been a real gift for me. Yeah. Cool. 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 Do you do any kind of impressions? Oh, not at all. Nope. I, okay. My humor is taught by my grandfather, deadpan, but I can tell you one of the funniest, funniest things that my grandfather ever did. He was a World War II veteran, so Confucius jokes. We're all sitting there. This is right before I moved uh, from New York to Colorado. And we're all sitting around the table. It was the night, actually, of my, a high school reunion of mine, my 10th high school reunion. And I decided not to go. I was hanging out with my fiance and my family. And I'm like, well, we're moving, so we'll stay. So we got Chinese food. We're getting to the end. So we went around the table and we're reading our fortunes. I'm looking at my grandfather. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. Because I he gets that look on his face. I like the the dry humor is crazy. So he pulls out <laughs> the fortune and he says, man with hole in pocket, feel a little cocky. We all, uh, tears, fell <laughs> on the floor because it, it was one of the best moments of his deadpan humor. That's usually what I get. And that's where I get my humor from. And a lot of times it's like, it's, I'm on, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a, like a thing that I can just pull out. But like when mm -hmm. I'm on, I'm on. And it, you know, usually it's like half the people don't get it. And that makes it funnier. So my grandmother didn't get it at all. She's like, what is everybody laughing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the way the way we normally wrap up is um what well, we'll get I usually ask you if you do any impressions only to have you to say whatever the 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 closing line of the show is in the impression. But I'll I'll get to that in a sec. Okay. Right now, the, the beginning of the close is normally, I'll say, uh, in a very Jerry Springer type way, right? If if you had, if let's say hypothetically, I gifted you this show, this is the very first episode, the pilot episode of your brand new podcast, Evolving with Drea Atherton. In your, in your very best, like Jerry Springer's final thought, the most valuable takeaways that could inspire people to be a better version of themselves. In the next couple of minutes. Oh my what gosh, would you that's tell a them lot of pressure. Well, like, like I'll try to bring back a little of my New York accent, but okay. definitely it's just love your neighbor. It's like they can be really annoying sometimes, but so can you. So just know that. Have a little patience with everybody around you and know that some of the most eccentric, weird people are the best people kind of like me. So thank you for listening to my podcast, Evolving with Andrea Atherton. <laughs> now, in your in your very best J Jerry Seinfeld impression, you say, be fun, have safe, keep evolving. Yes. Oh, and like I said, I can't, I'm not an impression. Be safe. What's the second one? <laughs> be fun, have safe. Safe or fun first? Be fun, have safe. Be fun, have safe, keep evolving. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. If this is your first time checking out the show. Got got a whole bunch of other ones. Make sure to hit subscribe and like and comment. Uh, and, you know, keep on, keep on this track with me. Be fun, have safe, keep evolving.